So today we will talk about section 4.3, which covers how derivatives affect the shape of a graph. So with the picture above here, we can notice a few things. Between A and B, and between C and D. So between A and B, between C and D, the derivative f prime of x is less than zero since the tangent lines have negative slope. So if you consider the tangent lines in these spots between A and B and between C and D, so looking at the tangents, if you were to take tangent lines here, all these lines have negative slopes between A and B, and also same thing between C and D, the tangents to this curve have negative slope, which means that the derivatives are negative. So remember, we can associate the derivative of a function at a particular point with the slope of the tangent line at that particular point. So then if you look between, let's say, B and C, so we look between B and C here, in this case, the derivative is going to be greater than zero. The derivative is positive since the tangent lines have positive slopes. So between B and C, if you look at the tangents to this curve, they're all going to be um, have positive slopes. And then we can say that it appears that the function f of x increases when f prime of x is positive. and decreases when x prime of x is negative. So this is giving us some information about a relationship between the derivative and the function itself. So this function increases when the derivative is positive. So between b and c, the derivative is positive. The slope is positive. So since the slope is positive, the function is increasing. Over here, when the slope is negative, or here when the slope is negative, the function is decreasing. So with that, we can see that if the derivative is positive on an interval, if the derivative is positive, that means the tangent line has a positive slope. So on that interval, then, at the, the function f of x is increasing. And where the derivative is negative, if f prime of x is less than zero on an interval, then f of x, the function itself, is decreasing on that interval. So looking at the graph above, notice that. So they want us to notice that the derivative f prime of x changes from negative to positive at b. So at b, the derivative changes from negative to positive. So the derivative here is all negative, the tangent slopes are all negative, and then it changes here to positive. And then it mentions that f of b is a local minimum. Not b, but f of b, the y value there, is a local minimum. There's a minimum here. When the derivative changes from negative to positive, we're at a, a little valley in the curve here, and there's a minimum there. And also over here, when the derivative changes from positive to negative, if it's positive, it's increasing, 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 then it turns to negative, it's decreasing. There's a local maximum at f of c. Again, not at c, but at the local maximum is f of c. So it occurs, you could say it occurs at C, but the, ma the local maximum is F of C. It's the Y value there. So to fill in the lines down here, we've got when the derivative changes from negative to positive at B, F of B is a local minimum. And again, it's F of B, the Y value, which is the local minimum. And when the derivative changes from positive to negative, 
f of c, that y value, is a local maximum. So what we were doing here is uh, setting us up for the, what's called the first derivative test, which we'll use quite a bit in this class. Now, the handout, for whatever reason, when I upload it onto this program I'm using, it, it has a hard time with a lot of the formatting. So there's this big gap here, and the, you can see the formatting here is not the greatest. So uh, make sure you download from Blackboard the original Word document, and it'll, it uh, will look a little bit better than this one. But the basic idea of what we just did of that picture that we've got, we've really done this, what's called the first derivative test. And it means it's a test based on the first derivative. Because we're also going to have the second derivative test, and that's a test based on the second derivative, or f double prime. So the first derivative test says this. Suppose that c is a critical number of a continuous function. So remember, critical number. That means... Remember from the past, c is a critical number means that either f prime of c equals 0 or f prime of c does not exist. And of course for us, the most important of the two is when the derivative is 0. Where the derivative is 0, you'll typically have a peak or a valley in the curve. So if c is that point, c is a critical number, and then see they're, they're talking about what's happening at C. So if the derivative changes from positive to negative at C, then there's going to be a local maximum at C. And the local maximum is f of C. Again, f of C will be the y value. That's the local maximum. You can kind of picture this by thinking, if the derivative changes from positive to negative, so the derivative being positive means the tangent slopes are all positive, and then it switches to negative, so you can kind of almost see that there's going to be a maximum right here. And that's just what, what this is showing. And then the other case here is if the derivative changes from negative to positive at C. So the derivative being negative, the slopes are all negative. The tangent, the tangent lines have all negative slopes. So then it switches to positive at this point C. So then it starts to come back up. So then we're going to have a local minimum, which is going to be f of c. So the first derivative test, intuitively, it just makes sense. And this is a test that we'll use quite a bit. So the other thing that can happen, though, is if uh, f prime doesn't change signs, if it's positive on both sides or negative on both sides, then it has no local maximum or minimum at c. And the example that we use for that one was if you have something like um, f of x equals x cubed. And if you look at the tangents here, these are positive on both sides. So even though um, f of 0 it would, be a it would be a critical number at 0, because the derivative, if you take the derivative of x cubed and set equal to 0 and, s and solve, you get x equals 0. So that would be one of the cases where there's no local max or min. So to get an idea of how all this works, well, let, me, let me just finish this. The example here would be um, f of x equals x cubed. But to see how this works, we've got example one. And you may need to write small on this one to make this all fit here. There's a lot of information we're going to go over right now for this problem. So we've got this. Rational expression, f of x is x plus 1 over x squared plus 3. And they want us to find the intervals on which f is increasing or decreasing. And remember, it's increasing where the derivative, the derivative of this is positive. to decreasing where the derivative of this is negative. So maybe I'll make a little note of that. Increasing, that means f prime is positive, right? Decreasing, f prime is negative. And then they want us to find the local maximum and minimum values of the function. So first thing we're going to need to do is find f prime of x. So we can 
Go ahead with the quotient rule. Low, d high, right? d high meaning derivative of high, low derivative of high, low d high minus high d low, all of the square of the bottom we go. So low, d high, the derivative of the numerator x plus 1 is just 1, right? So we don't really need anything. Low d high minus high d low, the derivative of the denominator is 2x. All over the square of the bottom we go. So this is going to be x squared plus 3. And then if I distribute this through here, and keep in mind we've got a negative there, that would be minus 2x squared minus 2x all over x squared plus 3 squared. So that's going to be equal to, let's see, minus x squared minus 2x plus 3 all over the numerator or denominator. So to we're going to have to factor this or try to factor it. But with this lead coefficient of a negative, I'm going to make it easier just by I'm going to factor that negative out because I think it's easier to work with. Then we get x squared plus 2x minus 3. Then this can factor this way. This, this one happens to factor, so we can factor it. And it factors this way, minus 1 plus 3. So we know that this function itself, this function is increasing when this thing is greater than 0, right? And this thing, this function is decreasing when this derivative is less than 0. So... We basically have to figure out where this is positive and where this is negative. And whenever you have one like this, there's a method you can always use. And um, I'm going to make a little note here just to make sure we're clear on this. This function itself, f of x, is increasing when the derivative... is positive. So when you were in algebra class, you would have had to solve inequalities like this. And the way you solve these is you divide the number line into intervals whose endpoints are the critical numbers. So whenever you have one like this, we can pretty much solve this the same way all the time. I'm going to write it right here. We're going to divide the number line into intervals whose endpoints are critical numbers. Remember, critical numbers are points where the derivative is either 0 or not defined. So, looking at this one, if we were to take this derivative and set it equal to 0, it would only be 0 if the numerator were equal to 0. And, right, because to make a fraction equal to 0, the numerator has to be 0. And the other thing is... Um, we have to be concerned with where this is not defined, but the only way it would be not defined is if we have division by zero, which we can't get, because to get division by zero, we'd have to have a zero here, so x squared would have to be equal to negative three. 
And in the real number system, that can't happen. So there's no way to make this denominator zero because whatever you plug in for x in a real number squared is going to be positive. So we can't make this equal negative 3 to make this zero. So there are no critical numbers where the derivative does not exist, but there are critical numbers at 1 and negative 3 because if x were equal to 1, the derivative would be 0. And if x were equal to negative 3, the derivative would be 0. So for us, we can just say this. We've got critical numbers at, for us, for this example, we get x equals 1, x equals negative 3 are critical numbers. Right, those are critical numbers here. So we're going to take this number line and divide it like this. Um, let's see, I'll go like this. Whoops. Got the number line here. I'm going to divide it at negative 3 and 1. These are critical numbers. So these are the only two numbers where the, where the derivative is 0, right? Only two numbers. So that if the derivative is positive at 2, it's going to be positive forever, right? Because the only way it could become negative after 2 is if it were 0 first, and it's not going to be 0 again. It's only 0 here and here. So basically, we need to check, a, pick a test point in each of these three areas. So we pick a test point that we're going to plug into the derivative and see if we get a positive or negative answer. So usually you just want to pick an easy one. So I'm going to pick like say negative 4, 0, and 2. Just because these are kind of easy ones to check. So basically I need to pick some number in this interval. And it doesn't matter if I pick negative 4, or negative 10, negative pi. It doesn't matter because whatever I get for the derivative when I plug in a negative 4, it's the same whether it's positive or negative. It's the same no matter what number I put in in this interval because the, the numbers here will give a positive or negative derivative and it won't change because the only time it could change is if it hits 0 first. It's only going to hit 0 here and here. So that's why I picked 0. I could have picked a negative 2, but 0 is usually easier to work with. And whatever sign I get for when I plug in negative 2 into the derivative, it's the same sign as I'll get when I plug in a 0. Because it can only change here and here. So the easiest way to do this is to think of it like this. I'm going to think of making, uh, let's uh, go x. Well, let's do this blue. I'm going to make x and then going to make f prime of x, which looks like this. It's going to be something like this. This is always positive. So what I'm doing here, I've, I've got this from the derivative itself. All right, so this... I don't actually have to calculate these. I just have to plug them in here. So for instance, when I use a test point of negative 4, I'm going to use negative 4 as a test point. So I plug in negative 4, and I'm going to get as a derivative minus, And I'm going to just think, if I plug in negative 4 in here, minus 4, minus 1, that's minus 5. I don't care about the minus 5. I just care that it's a negative. It's a negative number. Because really, all we need to know is, is the derivative positive or negative? If it's positive, the function's increasing. If it's negative, the function's decreasing. So I take a negative 4, plug it in here, it's a negative. Do you guys see that the denominator will always be positive? So I put a plus here. This is always going to be positive. So I plug in negative 4 here. Negative 4 plus 3, well, that's a negative number again. So this is negative. So then you basically have negative times negative, which is positive, times negative, which is negative, 
Then you have negative divided by a positive. So this is a negative number. So this is less than zero. So that means that on this interval right here, the derivative is less than zero. And if the derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. The function decreasing here. So then I'm going to pick the other test point, zero. I'm going to plug a zero in here. And when you plug a zero in here, I look up here, zero minus one, that's a negative. So, well, first let me just fill in this. Get a negative here. Plug a zero in here. Zero plus three, that's a positive. So it's a positive here. And then looking at this, whoops, we've got uh, negative times negative, which is positive, times positive divided by positive. So this is going to be greater than zero. So at this point, at zero, or at any point in this interval, the derivative is going to be a positive derivative. So on this interval, the derivative is positive, which means that the function itself is increasing. So we're looking at the derivatives here, and it's giving us information about the function itself, right? F prime F. F prime is positive. That means F is increasing on this interval. And then finally, the last point, I picked a 2 for a test point. And we plug this in. This is a plus for sure. So now, to look at the 2, 2 minus 1 is a positive. 2 plus 3 is still positive. So these are going to be two positives. And then we're going to have a negative times a positive times a positive. It's going to be a negative divided by a positive. It's going to be a negative. So here, on this interval, the derivative is negative. So we can say f prime is less than zero. Negative derivative means f is decreasing. So once we have this lined up, this is kind of like our, our reasoning we're using here. So now we can use the first derivative test and say that, okay, at negative 3, we know the derivative is zero. But before that, the function is decreasing. And then after that, it's increasing. So the function is decreasing. So think of the function as decreasing. Then it hits negative 3, it flattens out, then it increases. So it's decreasing, going down, 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 hits negative 3, then it starts to increase. So we know the curve has this u, it has this valley in it. So we know that at this point, there is a local minimum here. So there is a local minimum at x equals 3. Now to find the minimum, we have to plug 3 into the function. So the local minimum is equal to f of 3. Now be careful about this. This is the original function. We want to know the minimum value of the original function. So I have to plug this back into the original function. Whoops, there's a mistake here. You guys may have caught this. x equals negative 3, right? Local minimum is f of negative 3. So I plug in negative 3 into the original function, and we will get negative 1 sixth. So that's the local minimum. The local minimum is negative 1 sixth. It occurs at negative 3, and the value of it is negative 1 sixth. So there's a local minimum here. And then looking over here, we've got the function is increasing. It's 0 at 1, and then it decreases. So think it's doing this. It's doing this. It's increasing, flattens out at 1, then it decreases. So just imagine this being the curve. It's increasing, then decreases. Increases, then decreases. It's got to be a local maximum here. So at this point, there's a local max local maximum at x equals 1, and the local max is f of 1, 
if you plug 1 in the original function, you get 1 half. So, to answer the questions, I'm kind of running out of room here. So, um, I'm going to try to erase some of this so we can answer the questions. Sometimes, okay, sometimes this doesn't work for me. Okay, I'm just going to erase this so we can answer the questions. So, looking at our little table here, um, let's answer the question. So it says, they wanted us to find where the function is increasing or it's decreasing, so here's the answers. f of x is increasing on, now we look over here, it's increasing right here on this interval from negative 3 to 1. That's where it's increasing. So it's increasing on negative 3 to 1. And, and we're using this interval notation here. So you have open parentheses at negative 3 and 1. And then we can say f of x is decreasing on... Well, it's, in, it's decreasing on two intervals here. So this one, this is a number line. It goes from negative infinity up to negative 3 here, right? So we would say it's decreasing on negative infinity to negative 3 and also from 1 to infinity because it's also decreasing on this interval that starts at 1 and goes to infinity. So uh, the local minimum, we can answer also the local minimum we just said is right here, local minimum. Remember, here's an easy mistake. A lot of students will say local minimum is negative 3. It's not right. The local minimum is not negative 3. The local minimum is this, right? This is the local minimum. Or if you wanted to, you could say this. This would work. You could say the local minimum is negative 3, negative 1, 6. But we definitely have to have the y value here, right? We need that. And again, you could also just say the local maximum is one half.